Hello everyone. I've decided to shift gears in the material I present. It's based on the last video. Kind of felt like I was reinventing the wheel. That being said, if future demand changes for content presentation, I'd be happy to consider. So, as you can already tell, we're going to be talking about frontal lobe circuits in this video. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or DL. PFC. But before we start talking about circuits specifically, let's do a review of frontal lobe anatomy. I'm going to be using this app to show you some of the anatomy, because as you could tell by my previous video, I'm not the best artist. Before we get into the specifics here, this is the territory of the frontal lobe. The cutoffs at this portion are the central sulci. Now for those of you who are just getting into anatomy and are just starting out, there are a lot of folds on the brain. And this is of course to increase surface area to retain more matter in a smaller portion of space. So on the brain, we have two ways of characterizing these folds. First here, and think of this as a hill, where this apex is the top of the hill, and the bottom, of course, is the valley. So at the apex, we have the gyrus, and at the valleys, or the bottom, we have the sulcus. Okay, so going back to the brain here, you can see this part would be a gyrus, and then this part underneath, where you can see the valley, that would be the sulcus. Okay, so over here, let's start out with the gyrus rectus for frontal lobe anatomy. This is also called the straight gyrus, and you can't see it here, but just under this gyrus, we have the first cranial nerve, which is the olfactory nerve. Okay, and next here we have the inferior frontal gyrus. So inferior would mean under in this case, so lower portion of the frontal lobe. And this gyrus is actually one of the circuits we're going to talk about later, which is the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. And I'll scroll down here if you want to just jump ahead and get some of the functions. And of course, Broca's area is right here. Next, we have the insula. Kind of hard to see. This would be tucked in under the inferior frontal gyrus and the superior temporal gyrus here. Next, we have the middle frontal gyrus. So you can see we're working our way up. Inferior was down here. Here's the middle frontal gyrus. Now this is actually the same territory as the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Next we have the orbital gyri, which are down here, and just lateral to the straight gyrus. Next we have the precentral gyrus. This is actually also known as M1, which is primary motor cortex. Some of you may have heard of the homunculus, the motor homunculus, and this is where the homunculus is. We'll talk more about that in a later video. And working our way up to the top, we have the superior frontal gyrus, and this is involved with eye movements. Not to be confused with the cranial nerves, that control eye movements. And next, let's go into some of the sulci. And some people might call this sulci instead. So again, these are the folds or the bottoms. Here we have the central sulcus. Again, this is the boundary between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. Here we have the inferior frontal sulcus, which is right under the inferior frontal gyrus. And here's the olfactory sulcus, so as I mentioned before, right above the cranial nerve 1. 
Here is the orbital sulci. So you're probably seeing a pattern here. It's, it's very close in name between the gyrus and the sulcus, just referring to which part of the fold of the brain we're talking about. And very quickly, precentral sulcus is here, frontal temporal sulcus is here, and that's everything. Okay, and let's get back to talking about the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So I have some of the circuits listed out here, some of the main circuits, I should say. And when I say circuits, what I'm talking about is more than just looking at the brain as a set of separate regions that have separate functions. So as an example, down here we could be looking at the, you know, let's say dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. It has projections to the thalamus different parts of the thalamus, it has projections to the caudate, it has projections to other parts of prefrontal cortex. So when I say circuit, I'm saying that we have to appreciate the fact that different brain regions are not solitary in function, which of course makes it harder to isolate certain deficits at the cognitive level. However, we can still use the fact that circuits interact with each other to isolate lesion location. Okay. So again, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and I'm just going to refer to it as DLPFC from here on, because it's quite the mouthful, is the middle frontal gyrus in humans. So I'll go ahead and highlight that region here going to be about here. Okay, and as I just said, it has connections to the thalamus, and more specifically, the medial dorsal and the ventral anterior part of the thalamus. It also has connections to the basal ganglia, specifically the dorsal caudate, and globus pallidus. So the thalamus is pretty easy to locate at the sagittal cut of the brain, which is what you're seeing here, because of this little bump here, the intermediate mass of the thalamus. The caudate is above up here, and the globus pallidus would be buried under the putamen. Okay, so getting into the neuropsychology of the DLPFC, we're going to see quite a few cognitive domains. And being that this is the frontal lobe, so again this region here, this is mainly associated with our executive functioning. Now this is a huge umbrella term, and specifically what we're talking about is, excuse the typos, so you can think of executive functioning generically as a set of cognitive processes that help us attain a goal. Now you might be asking what kind of cognitive processes? Well, we'd have to talk about all the circuits to discuss that, but we're going to see a few of them here. So going into some of the processes, we have working memory, and I wrote manipulating Manipulating representations. So what this means is, let's say we're doing, you know, a certain test that involves memorizing numbers. So if I said 9, 7, 3, and can you put that in order from smallest to largest, you know, you would be taking 9, 7, 3 and changing that to 3, 7, 9. And in order to do that, you would be shifting the numbers around in your head. This is called a spatial representation. Of working memory. We also have cognitive flexibility. So what this is, I can give you an example actually. I want you to recite the alphabet, but between each letter I want you to count down from a hundred, subtracting by three. So it would be, you'd say A, 100, B, 97, C, 94, and so on. Someone who has a lesion in the DLPFC wouldn't be able to do this. 
they might do something that's called perseveration. So they might go A, 100, B, 97, C, D, E, F, and then they go on. So when I say perseveration, what we're talking about is when you get caught in on a certain type of task and you can't disengage from that. Disengaging and changing tasks, again, that's part of executive functioning. We also have decisions, so that's pretty straightforward, deciding what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and so on. We also have higher order motor control. So you might remember that previously we talked about the motor cortex, which is here. I'll highlight in pink. Motor cortex is, again, movement of different body parts. So, of course, since everything is a circuit, we're going to have connections from motor cortex to DLPFC. And, of course, other parts of the frontal lobe, but in this case, we're just talking about one region. So, higher order motor control means once the signal is sent from motor cortex to this brain region, then the brain has to decide what to do and you know if you should do it or inhibit the movement if it's the best choice towards attaining the goal essentially and this brings up one of my favorite neuropsych terms dysdiadocokinesia dysdiadocokinesia refers to the inability to perform rapid alternating movements it's a form of ataxia that you can also see in the cerebellum Ataxia refers to the loss of control of body movements. So when you have dysdiadocokinesia, again, let's, let's do an example here. I want you to take your hand and just tap on the table between rock, paper, and scissors. So rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. Someone with this deficit would ultimately get stuck on one of the three or just completely stop doing the task. We also have... Components of personality. Pretty straightforward. Most of you have probably heard of Phineas Gage. I won't get into that. Okay, and also we have something called lateralization of the brain. So I'll go back here to show you. So lateralization refers to each hemisphere here. So we have the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. Each one is associated with a different set of functions based on our handedness. So on the left side we have manipulating verbal and spatial knowledge and working memory. That's going to go back to our numbers over here. And I should also say that, so let's say this is one lobe here and this is the other. So on the left we have verbal, and this is for right-handed people. So left is verbal, and right is nonverbal. And I hope most people's brains are not going to look like that, in comparison of size. And on the right side, we have negative attitude mediation and verbal and spatial reasoning. So we already talked about some of the things that could happen with lesions in this area. It's good to memorize and associate it with this circuit because all the other circuits have different functions. So you might see personality, you might also see shifting issues, but if we see this combination of weaknesses, so executive functioning, working memory, and cognitive flexibility, then we're going to know that there is some issue with the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex or some issue with part of the projections of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex to thalamus or other parts of cortex and so on.